spend a little bit of time reviewing interfaces and then we're going to talk about boxing all right and then we are going to talk about exceptions so we'll probably get to all of these today we might not necessarily finish exceptions but um, we'll give it a shot so let's look at interfaces how many classes can a class extend how many classes can a class inherit from one how many classes can a class implement how many interfaces can a class implement many yeah a bunch of them all right remember that interfaces are partly a way to handle the fact that there's multiple inheritance Inheritance, you get two benefits from. You get the benefit of the reuse of code, that you can write code in the superclass and you don't have to duplicate it in the subclass. You also get the benefit of polymorphism. And basically, <coughs> what polymorphism says is that any place a animal object is required, for example, we can put in an animal class or we can put in any subclass of animal. So if mammal is a subclass of animal, any time that we have a animal class required, we can give it a mammal class. Because we know that a mammal is going to have all the, all the functions, all the methods that exist on the animal. All right, We know that because it inherits them. A dog, we can put in a dog object if a, if a animal class is required because we know that with inheritance a dog is going to have all the methods that are defined on the animal. Now it might have some extra but it's at least going to have those. All right. So any place that we, we can have a super class we can plug in any one of its subclasses. All right. And when we call a method we get that subclass's version of the method. So if we call a make sound method on a dog class, we get the dog's make sound method. If we call it on a cat class, we get the cat's version of that method, and so on down the line. So any place that a superclass is required, we can give one of the subclasses, because we know that that subclass is going to have all the functions that are in the superclass. And what's more, we'll get the right version of that function. We'll get the version of the function that belongs to the class that we actually plugged in there. Interfaces, the idea is the same. What I just described in sort of an informal way is the notion of polymorphism. Interfaces are the same way. We can put in any place that an interface is allowed, we can put in any class that implements that interface. Okay. And when we call a method on it, we're going to get the proper version of that function for the class that we created. All right. In addition, what an interface is, and when a class implements an interface, is essentially a promise. It's a promise that that class that implements the interface is going to have all the methods that exist on the interface. All the methods that exist on the interface are going to be abstract methods. All right, so there's going to be an implementation for all those abstract methods, unless, of course, it itself is a uh, uh, an abstract class. But that's another issue. All right, because of that, because we know for a fact that anything that implements an interface has all those functions that are defined in the interface, we can use any class that implements it where that class, that interface is required. So let's take a look at the example that we did last week, or Monday, rather, with all that in mind.
we look in here, we have an interface that is called has seats. All right? We can, we've defined that interface to have two methods. A how many seats method and whether a certain number of people will fit in that thing. All right? And remember, has seats can be anything that has seats. It doesn't have to follow a certain inheritance structure. It can be all over the place. And we talked about it last time, how rooms, offices, and all that can have seats. All right? And also vehicles. Now, vehicles and rooms may, have, may, may uh, extend from, may inherit totally different superclasses, but they have the one characteristic in common, and that is they have seats. We talked about the is a rule with inheritance, that this is a that, all right? A car is a vehicle. A office is a room. So we could have those inheritance structures built in, and we can still implement the interfaces by saying, well, both a car and a office is an entity that has seats. So it's sort of an ISA, but it's not as strong as a, of, a, of an ISA, right? Um, the example I gave last time is, you think of a bird as an animal. Bird is also something that has feathers. A bird is also something that can fly. So a bird could implement the has feathers in interface and can fly interface. If there was some need to group all those things together and treat them the same. All right? So here's our interface for has seats. We implement that interface in two different classes in this example, an auditorium and an office, or I'm sorry, and a room. And notice that both of these are going to have these functions that follows this signature. Returns an integer, accepts no arguments. Accepts an integer, returns a Boolean. How many seats fits? So that function is declared on the room object, and that function is also declared. Oh, that was the auditorium class, and it's also declared on the room class. Now notice that the specific implementation of that get how many seats can be totally different. All right? Notice that in this case, how many seats are in a room depend on the kind of room that it is. And we've defined four or five different room types. Uh, an office, a classroom, a lab, and a lecture hall. Notice the auditorium doesn't have anything like that. It just has a capacity. These functions can look totally different depending on the implementation of the interface. All that's required is that that function exists in the class. All right? What happens if it doesn't exist? If it doesn't exist, it will not compile. So if I do not have the fits function in the office or in the room class, I'm not going to be able to compile. Because by implementing the interface, I've promised that every function that exists on the interface exists in the room class. And if I don't keep my promise, compiler is going to be angry at me. All right. Room does not override the method fits in has seats. Because it doesn't have a fits function in it, it cannot implement that interface. 
because when we say that we implement that interface, we have made a promise that all the functions in the interface are going to be contained in that class. Why is that necessary? That's necessary because If I know it has those functions, if the compiler knows it has those functions, then any place that a has seats object is required, I can plug in any of the various forms, the polymorphism of that object. So I went and added that function back in, and now it compiles. If I look at the unit test, You'll see my unit test creates several different objects, a room, an auditorium, the room's office. The auditorium has a capacity of 100. Created another object. I've created uh, an array of has seats. And I've added each of those to the array. I'm going to get rid of this line. That was to illustrate something else. I can put these in the array list that expects has seats because both of these implement the has seats. So I can then go and call the get how many seats method. And the compiler knows it's going to work because everything in this array list implements the interface has seats. And if it implements the interface has seats, it has those functions in it. All right? It will take a few examples to see the real power of this. All right? This is the first example. But essentially, think of it that when we implement an interface, we're allowing that object to be plugged in anywhere where something of that interface is required. You can almost think about it like in hardware with a USB port. All right? With a USB port, as long as it has a USB plug, you can plug it anywhere where there's a USB port. And it should work, right? Ideally. All right? Now, there might be drivers or whatever, but essentially, you plug it in, it works. You plug in a digital camera with a USB port to your computer, you should be able to pull the photos off. You plug in a USB microphone, as long as it has that port you, or, or a plug, you plug it in, should be able to use a microphone on the computer. All right? So that USB is like an interface. As long as it has that interface, you should be able to plug it in anywhere that's expecting that, that kind of interface, that kind of plug. And it's the same idea with this. Any questions about this? Yes? Yeah, you're, you're right. It's not as good as inheritance. It's not as powerful as inheritance. Because remember, with inheritance, you can reuse code, right? But it is valuable to know that a certain group of objects implements an interface, because then we know, we're guaranteed by the compiler that they all have these functions in them. And if we know for sure that they have these functions in them, we can plug it into anywhere where that interface is required. So yeah, it, it gives us the power of polymorphism. It doesn't give us the power of uh, reusing the code. So in that, in that respect, it's like a um, less powerful uh, thing to do. But that polymorphism thing really is powerful, all right? Because anywhere that something is required, you can plug that in. All right? And it doesn't matter where it lives in the inheritance structure. You can implement interfaces all over the place. One example that I uh, thought of is you could have uh, in a supermarket, or, or, or you know, let's say a superstore that has a supermarket and also sells um, other products. Uh, 
there might be a certain category of things which are age restricted. All right? You know, alcoholic beverages, tobacco products, R rated movies, Sudafed. I don't know, there's probably other ones too, where you have to be a certain age to purchase them. All right? Now, you could implement that interface, and as you're if you have software to process what people are ringing up, every time you see that, you could ask for a confirmation of someone's age and make sure that they're legal to purchase that product. Okay? So that's something that really is a consideration because if there was some sort of processing that you wanted to do for these age restricted items, age restrictions could exist all over the place within a supermarket or a, a store's products. It's not going to be just a specific place on the, on the uh, 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 inheritance structure. And that way, you can make any of these products implement that interface, and anywhere needed, you could use that functionality. Other questions? We're going to use interfaces. We have an assignment that deals with interfaces. When we start creating user interfaces, all right, we're going to use the concept of an interface again. Now, don't be confused between user interface and this sort of interface. It's just a coincidence that they both use the word interface. But it's a happy coincidence because we're going to use interfaces when we create our user interfaces. So we'll, we'll get into them uh, at that point as well. Questions about this? Now, let's go through some rules about this. Can I create an instance of an interface? So can I say, has seats x equals new has seats? Can I do that? No. All right. An interface is a lot like an abstract class, so you can instantiate it. And it will tell us that, can instantiate it. If I do create a new class, Let's create a moped class. Is there still such a thing as mopeds? OK. Let's create one. Now, moped is something totally different than a room, right? Now, it might have a whole bunch of methods of its own, and it might have its own constructors or whatever. But if we promise that it implements this, we have to make sure it has both of these two classes. So I don't know if there's any bigger mopeds, but I'm going to say the capacity of a moped's one. So that's a real simple interface, right? One person can ride on a moped. And if arg is less than or equal to 1, then that many people can fit on the moped. Otherwise, no, they can't fit on the moped. So you see, it's totally different than the other ones. But I need both of those methods in order to say that I implement that interface. And if I define both of them, yeah. if I define both of them, then I'm OK. And I can create.
a new moped, add it to the list, because again, it implements the has seat interface, so I could do anything with it that I could do to anything else that, ha that implements the has seats interface. And I can run it. And it tells me that the office seats three people, the auditorium seats 100, and the moped seats only one. So again, wildly different things. If we had a bigger class structure, the um, moped would certainly be have different super classes than an auditorium or a room, but they can still be treated together because they all implement that interface. Okay. Of course, if I didn't have one of those methods on the moped, I would get an error. Whoops. Now, one last thing to remember. I did something like this a minute ago. And I said that was not legal, because I cannot create an instance of an abstract uh, class or a interface. I can, however, do this. I can create a new instance of a moped class and store the pointer to that class in a has seats pointer. Okay? I'm allowed to do that. Remember, this side determines which functions you can call. So I could only call the functions that exist on the has seats interface. This side, however, determines the precise class that gets created and therefore determines the version of the class and the version of the functions that I'm going to get. Yes? Is there a specific reason why you would want to do this? Um, not to do this per se. You might, you might do something like this, but maybe something like this. Let's say I wrote a function. public static void, and my function's name is show capacity. And I might want to give to that function any argument that implements that interface. Because if I said moped here, if I said moped here, then I could call this function and give it the moped. All right.
that in the wrong place. I took out that function for a second. Finally, okay, let's look at what I what I had done. I created a function here that accepts a moped, and I can create a moped and call that function for that, and it's going to work. And it shows me the capacity of the moped is 1. OK? Now, I could not give, however, a room to that function. All right? Because that function is expecting a moped. And the compiler is going to complain about it. Can't give that function a room. It wants a moped. Now, if I wanted my function to be flexible enough to take up anything that implements that interface, I would make this argument a has seats argument. Then I can call it with anything that implements that interface, a moped, a room, whatever. This isn't exactly what I did. But it's the same idea. I'm referring to this variable by the interface, and therefore that gives me the flexibility of give anything that implements that interface there. And because of polymorphism, I'll get the right version of that function. So if I do that, then it compiles, and it shows me the right value for that. Other questions? All right. Next thing we're going to talk about is called boxing. All right. And boxing relates to primitives and object references and objects. In array lists, for example, when we declare an array list, we declare the kind of object that goes into that array list. So here we declared our array list as consisting of any object that implements the has seats interface. Array lists require there to be objects. You can't put primitives into an array list. All right? You can only put objects into an array list. That's one of the restrictions. That's one of the differences with arrays, and that's one of the restrictions. Now, what is a primitive? Right. Ex examples of, prim uh, of primitives are things like an int, a double, a Boolean, and we can tell looking at them, and this is why it's so important to follow conventions. When you name your classes, I said give all your classes capital letters, because that's what it is in a Java framework. A string, for example, is not a primitive, and we can tell that at a glance because it starts with a capital S. Well, these are all primitives. They start with lowercase. Here's a list of Java primitives. Bob. 
byte, character, short, int, long, float, double, boolean, and void. There's maybe like 10 of them. All right? <coughs> now, the problem is, is that you can't put primitives in an array list. You're just not allowed to. And there's other cases where an objects are required and primitives won't do. So there's a number of classes that exist as sort of wrappers to primitives. They go around a primitive and they're sort of the object version of the primitive. And they start with capital letters. The object version of an int is a class called integer. The object version of a double is a class called double. But again, notice this capital D for double. And Boolean for Boolean. It's one reason why it's case sensitive. Java, right? Because so you can tell, did you want the primitive or did you want the class? All right? These are called wrapper classes because they just sort of make object versions of the popular primitives that are used. All right? So if you ever need an object version of an integer, for example, you can, of an int, I should say, you can put it in a integer class and it will work. Now what does object and or what does what does boxing and unboxing mean? Well, let's look at an example. I've posted online. When they invented these classes, they said, well, we want them to be as easy to work with as the primitives are. But normally, as we've seen, objects and primitives, we address them in different ways. We use methods with objects, whereas with primitives, we just use the primitive itself. Boxing and unboxing relates to making it seamless to convert between the integer and the int class, or the double and the double primitive. So let's look at an example. Look in boxing. All right. Notice we have int x equals one, int y equals five. Then I have an integer which is the class version of it, the object version of it, and say z equals 3, and then I have an integer q. Now notice that in the rest of these expressions, in these expressions, I can use the int and the integer interchangeably. So for example, I can add an int to an integer and store the result in an integer. This looks no different than the instruction if all of them were ints. And some of them are ints, and some of them are integers. So the idea of boxing is that if I say z equals 3, it takes that 3 and makes an object version of it. It puts it in an object box. That's what boxing means. It treats it like an object, 
Another word to say it, way to say it is it puts it in an object box. So we don't have to do something like integer z equals new integer 3. That's how we'd do it with just about any other class that we were creating an instance of. Would follow the object sort of language for this and use a constructor. Well, when they introduced these integers, they said, well, we want to make it easy for people to use them. Make it just the same as if they're using the primitive. So with the primitive, remember, you don't call a constructor. You just give it a value. Well, boxing allows us to do the same thing with these integer object references. So I can say integer z equals 3, and the compiler's smart enough to make a object of type integer and stuff the value 3 inside of it. And likewise, if I do math on these, if I do math on these things, all right, x is an int, z is an object reference, it does what's called unboxing. In other words, it will take out the 3 from the, the object box and use it in a mathematical expression. Or the same thing here. It takes it out of the object box and displays it. It's inherent in Java period. With between any of these, I'm doing the example with ints and integers, but if I did the same thing with doubles and double or whatever. I like int and integers because the names are slightly different. For doubles, it's the same name. It's just capital versus lowercase. All right? Now, there can be a little bit of confusion here. I'm going to see if I can recreate the confusion that exists in here. Comment out the rest of this stuff. <coughs>
All right, I didn't do it here. But I've seen cases where if you compare an object to an object, even though their values are equal, it will tell you that they're not equal because they're not the same object. It's always safer when you're comparing objects to say equals. And in this case, it doesn't matter, but I have seen instances where it does matter. quickly try to look that up. Pitfalls of boxing and auto boxing. They show an example here of doing a comparison and that doesn't work out correct. So the bottom line is use a Use a uh, use the dot equals method if you're comparing two things. Okay. I don't think I have time. Just a couple minutes left to start exceptions, so we will leave exceptions until Monday of next week. All right, but that's where we'll pick it up. I assume you all have seen exception processing from C sharp, so it'll be very similar to that, but we're going to maybe take uh, it a little bit further in this class. Um, but we'll see. All right, see you next week.